Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we infuse your brain with weird and wonderful science. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this gut bacteria edition, we hear about horizontal gene transfer between bacteria from Professor Michael Archer. But first, here's news of gut bacteria reversing aging, setting our body clocks, improved by grapes and targeted by CRISPR. reverse aging in mice. Researchers from APC Microbiome Island at University College Cork have found that transplanting gut microbes from young mice into old mice reverses aging in the brains and immune systems of the old mice. Previous studies suggested that an aging gut microbe population is connected to aging all over the body. Fecal Microbiota transplantation, or poo transplants, in the form of a fecal enema has been successfully used to cure Clostridium difficile infections. Clostridium difficile causes severe diarrhea and inflammation, so people suffering the disease have been motivated to seek out the unpleasant treatment. Before the transplants, the mix of microbes in the guts of the old mice were measured to be much less diverse than the gut microbes of the young mice. The researchers transplanted faeces from either young, 3 to 4 months, or old, 19 to 20 month, donor mice. They transplanted faeces from old mice to old mice to control for the effects of handling the mice. After 4 weeks, the old mice with the young transplants had gut microbiomes identical to the young mice. Not only did an infusion of faeces from young mice rejuvenate the brain and immune systems of the old mice, but it even improved the way their DNA expressed brain immune proteins, making them less at risk of Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis. They found 35 metabolic proteins in the brains of mice with old transplants were restored to youthful levels. Some of the metabolites are known to cross the blood-brain barrier, but researchers suspect that there are also indirect brain effects from the gut bacteria. The old mice with the transplanted young gut microbes performed better than the old mice with old gut microbes in the Morris water test, where a mouse is submerged in a pool of water so that it has to navigate its way to a platform. It's sort of solving a maze. On dissection, in the brains of old mice transplanted with young gut microbes, the brains had a younger-looking hippocampus, the part of the brain that regulates memory and learning. The researchers found changes in nine gut-brain modules. Gut-brain modules are psychoactive compounds either produced by bacteria in the gut or removed by bacteria in the gut. They're one of the major ways that gut bacteria can affect the brain. They found changes in bacteria that cause differences in the metabolism of short-chain fatty acids, which are involved in the regulation of immune cell function, gut-brain communication, and aging. Parts of the immune system that become overactive with aging and cause autoimmune diseases and inflammation were reduced in the old mice with young faecal transplants. The researchers believe that the next steps are to identify the specific gut microbes that were missing from the old mice and added from the young mice. They believe that future treatments for humans may involve foods with prebiotic components like oligofructose-enriched inulin that promotes healthier gut bacteria and possibly capsules of the exact bacterial mix that older people are missing. At this stage, they aren't recommending humans reproduce the mouse experiments and get transplants of faecal matter from young people. Of course, when transfusions of young blood to old mice cause some rejuvenation effects, this didn't stop American billionaires setting up a market for young human blood. 
If this is repeated with poo transplants, at least young people can donate faeces more often than they can donate blood. The paper was titled, Microbiota from Young Mice Counteracts Selective Age-Associated Behavioural Deficits, and was published in the journal Nature Aging. Gut bacteria make larks and owls. Researchers from the University of Haifa and the Technion in Israel have discovered that certain gut bacteria differ between morning and evening people. Researchers examine the difference in the populations of gut bacteria and in the diets of early risers, intermediate and late sleepers. The world is run for the benefit of larks, so people born as owls, when forced to get up early for work or school, tend to suffer from various health issues such as obesity, diabetes, higher cardiovascular risk, mood disorders and high stress levels. People mostly come in two chronotypes, which previous research has shown have genetic differences. Generally, you're born as an early or late chronotype. There's a genetic predisposition. Morning type people tend to get up early and are generally more alert in the morning. For this reason, they're called larks. Evening owls, on the other hand, tend to be more alert in the evening. They're able to sleep late in the morning and they prefer activities later in the day. This diurnal preference has a major impact on our sleep pattern, physiology, health and psychology. Previous studies showed the fifth of the population of our gut microbes change over the course of a day in a cycle closely linked to our circadian rhythm. Teenagers are more often owls and elderly people are more often larks. It changes as you get older. The researchers collected faecal samples from 91 people. Analysis of the DNA sequences from each sample showed the identity of different gut bacterial species and how abundant they were. The chronotype of the participants was determined based on their self-reported sleep times during the weekend, that is, waking up without an alarm clock. The researchers found that early risers tended to have a higher population of Allostipes putridinus bacteria, which was previously found to be very much elevated in elderly mice and elderly humans. This fits with the tendency of older people to become early risers as they age. Late sleepers tended to have a higher population of Lachnospira pectinoschiza bacteria. The researchers also found that people who ate their biggest meal after 2pm also had a higher population of Lachnospira pectinoschiza bacteria in their gut. The researchers found a difference in the way that the non-carbohydrate nutrients are converted into glucose, gluconeogenesis. This process is activated by short-chain fatty acids, produced by the fermentation of soluble fibres by gut bacteria, and is known to follow our circadian rhythm. Larks tended to eat more high-fibre foods and drink more water. Owls tended to eat more simple sugar, high-protein and sugary drinks. The researchers hoped to follow up with a much larger sample size. The authors hope that their research could lead to changes in diet that could help naturally late sleepers suffer less when forced to attend work and school early by early risers. Or... Perhaps we could convince the early risers to have some tolerance, or dare I even ask, compassion for people born differently to them, and adjust our schedules from 19th century factory hours into a diverse mix of working and study patterns, which can also incorporate working from home and video streaming meetings and lessons. The paper was titled... Metagenomic analysis reveals the signature of our gut microbiota associated with human chronotypes and was published in the journal Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology. Grapes help your guts. Researchers at the University of California, Los Angeles in the United States have discovered that eating grapes improves the diversity of the microbes in our gut, which leads to weight loss, improved liver function and better heart health through lower blood cholesterol and liver cholesterol. Grapes are known to contain catechins, proanthocyanidins, anthocyanins, leucoanthocyanidins, quercetin, camphorol, stilbenese, ellagic acid, and hydroxycinamates, which have antioxidant, antibacterial, and antiviral effects. And grapes are a good source of fiber. 
Researchers gave 19 subjects aged between 21 and 55 four weeks of a low-fibre, low-polyphenol diet. Essentially, much less fruits and vegetables. For the second four weeks, they added 46 grams of grape powder each day to their diet, which is the equivalent of two serves of grapes per day. They found the populations of different gut bacteria were changed by the addition of grape powder to the diet and became more diverse. Less diverse gut bacteria is associated with inflammatory and autoimmune diseases, particularly the diseases of old age. There was an upregulation of bacteria that helped form a protective barrier in the gut. There was an increase in the number of anti-inflammatory and immune system boosting bacteria. Cholesterol levels were reduced by 6%. Bile acids are made in the liver and released in the gut to digest fats, and then reabsorbed by the blood. Lower bile acid levels in the blood generally show a healthier liver. Bile acid levels were reduced by 40% in people eating the grape powder. The paper doesn't say, but I suspect the researchers used grape powder to avoid issues with keeping grapes fresh. It standardises the results. So the conclusion is that if your diet is poor in fruit and vegetables, then eat two servings of grapes every day, and you'll be enormously healthier and even age more slowly. If you already eat more than 10 servings of fruit and vegetables every week, then grapes are a pleasure to eat when they're in season. Perhaps they'll improve your health as well. More research is needed. The paper was titled Effects of Standardised Grape Powder Consumption on the Gut Microbiome of Healthy Subjects, a pilot study, and was published in the journal Nutrients, from the Multidisciplinary Digital Publishing Institute. CRISPR for targeted antibiotics. Researchers at the University of Sherbrooke in Canada have been able to incorporate a loop of CRISPR-Cas9 instructions in a probiotic gut bacteria that was able to eliminate 99.9% of the target antibiotic-resistant bacteria in a mouse's gut from one dose in just four days. CRISPR-Cas are the systems that bacteria have evolved to protect themselves from viral infection. Researchers in 2012 realised that they could use this system to precisely locate and change genes. Genetic engineers can match a DNA sequence to a sample of RNA and then cut and paste, or switch on and off, or switch genetic letters, or just snip to make exact changes to their target DNA and nothing else. CRISPR-Cas9 is the most common system used, but many more have been developed. If you identify and cut both strands of DNA in a bacterium, then it can't heal the cut and dies. Previous research had shown that a big limit on the effectiveness of using CRISPR-Cas9 was how well the plasmid loop containing the CRISPR-Cas9 system in the probiotic bacteria would transfer to other bacteria in the gut. The team evolved in the lab a variety of bacterial plasmid loop that was better at reproducing and transferring DNA. Gut bacteria share DNA quite often, which is how antibiotic resistance can spread from one species to another. Mice were given the target bacteria by a tube in their mouth leading straight to their stomach, and a dose of engineered probiotic bacteria with a CRISPR-Cas9 plasmid loop, 12 hours later. For the next four days, the researchers analysed bacteria in the mouse faeces to count up the populations of dead target bacteria. In the controls, there was no change, but In the mice treated with the bacteria with the CRISPR seek and destroy loops, the target bacteria was reduced by 98% in one and a half days, and by 99.9% in four days. They also tried giving mice the CRISPR engineered bacteria first, and the target harmful bacteria 12 hours later. They had the same result of drastically reduced target bacteria. They examined 10 of the most common bacteria in the mouse gut and found no reduction in any of their populations. They also gave mice the target bacteria followed by the common antibiotic streptomycin. The target bacteria started to die off but evolved resistance and grew back within two days. 
When these mice were then given the CRISPR-carrying bacteria, 99.9% .9 of the antibiotic-resistant target bacteria were killed. The researchers hope that this technology could lead to replacements for antibiotic drugs and treat infections that are resistant to antibiotics. Probiotic bacteria with a CRISPR-Cas9 load could be used to target the bacteria more common in Crohn's disease, or the bacteria common in many cases of obesity, for example. The paper was titled, High Efficiency Delivery of CRISPR-Cas9 by Engineered Probiotics Enables Precise Microbiome Editing, and was published in the journal Molecular Systems Biology. You're listening to Ian Wolf on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. And finally, from the 2003 vaults, here's Professor Michael Archer explaining how bacteria share DNA across species to Marion Carruthers and I on my old cassette recorder, which was later digitized at 20 kilobits a second for broadcast. Where there are certainly cells, bacterial cells, that are actively exchanging chromosomal information with the cells of our body. So these are prokaryotes, the simplest kinds of organisms, basically having little naughties, if you like, yeah. cellular naughties, with the cells of, of eukaryotes, the so more so-called advanced organisms, and creating hybrid cells that are viable. So, you know, this kind of, and this, when, when you think people worried about genetic engineering, oh my God, you know, what if, what if we take this cell and we mix it with this cell of, a, of the same species and everybody gets their knickers in a knot? Naturally, there are organisms across whole kingdoms here that are experimenting with little naughties in the dark. And this is, genetic engineering is the reason we're here. It, it just seems to me so silly not to recognize the fact that blind genetic engineering, and who would approve of that in an ethics proposal? You know, we'll just keep trying everything without any sense of what we're doing, as opposed to what's really the exciting frontier, which is strategically managed genetic engineering for a purpose, you know, within the confines of experimental procedures that are, are reliable. And, and to have to run the gauntlet to do that strikes me as amusing, when right in our own guts, the very people who are prohibiting it are doing experiments that would never approve, in an ethics uh, committee, you know, and it's going on in their gut. Nobody got permission to do that. So all the time, bacteria and other microorganisms are exchanging genes with our own body cells, and which are then changing as a result. So it would appear. I mean, one of the, the interesting outcomes of the Human Genome Project, it's still quite controversial, was to identify large slabs of the human genome that don't appear to belong to us. So, yeah, we have the, these retroviruses and things that are actually plugging or unplugging strips of DNA from one organism into another. We are the result of, 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 of uh, three and a half billion years of this kind of blind, mad scientist stuff that is part of the natural world. Now, we're not going to say that we're a terrible outcome of this. We're the disaster that demonstrates you should never allow genetic engineering to occur. We're pretty proud of us. And yet we're the product of that without anybody actually working their way through it and strategically managing the process. So, it seems to me nuts to, uh, to turn away from this frontier and say, no, we should all leave it to blind chance, rather than actually become more proactive about improving aspects of it. There, there's a shrew called Hero's Shrew. This is a shrew has always impressed me. It's a little tiny mammal, a really bitty little thing. But Frank, you could almost drive a tractor on top of that shrew, and it would just shrug, because it has a backbone that has about nine different interlinking systems that animal is indestructible. <laughs> and when you think of all of the humans who suffer from problems with backs, and I think, well, how many genes make up here, you know, that cause the, the vertebrae of the hero shrew to do this super strengthening? What if it's five genes? Would it be so terrible to see what happens if you translocated them and added them to the human genome and suddenly had nobody having bad backs, nobody snapping their back, if they happen to be stupid enough to dive in the water and hit their head, no supermens in, in um, you know, wheelchairs, is this such a bad thing? 
But of course, we uh, we are driven in society today by the the principle of, of minimizing risk, and therefore we don't do things rather than take the chance that the outcome might but not be something that we want. I, I, it's a terrible thing to me. The uh, the importance of being able to trial these things uh, is part of what science is all about. It, it and nature has got us to this point, invited us, showed us the tools it's used in effect, and. How dumb would we be not to then say, well, thanks. You know, it's like, like somebody doing work for you on a computer and not showing you how it's done. You know, what's the point of that? They need to show you what they've done, invite you to get involved, write your own specific programs. Well, we're at that threshold now. And I think we're mad if we turn our back on the ability to improve so many things about ourselves, about our relationships with the planet and the future of the planet by taking a little responsibility here in the steerage of this system rather than just leaving it to blind chance. It's also a fear of the unknown because you're dealing with larger systems than just bacteria or shrews, you're dealing with people. So when I think of, you know, um, genetic engineering with a shrew, I think of a guy with wings flapping out the back. So Sounds I'm, good to me. Gee, <laughs> genetic experiment. And to me that's, that's horrible because of all these science fiction movies and it, it just seems unnatural. Let's just theory. explore that. Supposing you went back in time and you interviewed Professor Trilobite, you know, you're, you're 300 million years ago, and you said to Professor Trilobite, I see an opportunity for you guys to get out on the land, because here's all this resource, here's this solar energy, plants are, are out there, you know, there, there's some reasons why you guys might actually get a big benefit. And your counterpart might be, you know, a second Professor Trilobite who would hold up your, your tentacles and your, your feet in horror in the lovely saltwater pond you're in, and so I think that sounds horrible. If you were out there, you'd, you'd, have, you'd have to be breathing air. It's, it's going to dehydrate you. There's going to be stresses. I mean, this is creating monsters. No, let's just stay where we are and do what we're doing. But, of course, nature didn't think that way. And nature basically went, yeah, trilobites are wonderful things, but they're extinct. That was Michael Archer, Dean of Science at the University of New South Wales, talking about horizontal gene transfer, little naughties in the dark, with Marion Carruthers and me. Bacteria are found almost everywhere in our environment. Some float around in the air. Some are in water or other liquids. Still others thrive in the soil. Some kinds are indispensable. In fact, the effects of bacteria are so important that life as we know it would be impossible without them. Most bacteria are friends of man. Some even produce chemicals called antibiotics that are used to help fight different diseases. Only a few kinds of bacteria cause disease. Bacteria may be separated into groups according to what they live upon, the nature of the food they require. Some bacteria are parasites, others saprophytes, and still others autotrophs. Parasites depend upon living plants or animals for food. Most bacteria that cause human disease are parasitic. Saprophytes live upon dead plants or animals or their products. Saprophytic bacteria produce enzymes that cause the chemical breakdown we call decay. There are more kinds of saprophytic bacteria than of any other type. Autotrophs get their energy from minerals or other inorganic materials. The autotrophic bacteria seen here live upon a form of iron. Through oxidation, they change one form of iron into another and use the energy that is released. Unlike the large majority of plants, most bacteria have no chlorophyll with which to manufacture food. Parasites, saprophytes, and autotrophs all take in food through their cell walls. To pass through these cell walls, the food must be soluble. In some instances, insoluble foods are converted into soluble materials by chemicals released by the bacteria themselves. All bacteria require soluble food to live. Structure or shape is one of the principal characteristics used by bacteriologists to classify or identify different kinds of bacteria. Today, in bacteriology laboratories, work is conducted that leads to the control of the relatively few bacteria that are foes of mankind, and to the more effective use of the multitudes that are friends, in order to make human life more healthful and increase our standard of living. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Are you a scientist, artist, biohacker or maker who'd like to be interviewed about your work? Would your company like to sponsor Diffusion? 
Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please subscribe to the Diffusion Science Radio channel on youtube.com slash c slash diffusion radio and rate the show on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including Radio Blue Mountains 89.1 FM in New South Wales, 8 Triple C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2 MVR in Nambucca Valley, 3 MVR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7 LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, and 2 XFM in Canberra. Diffusion is narrowcast on Indigo FM 88 in North East Victoria. Diffusion is syndicated globally on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com. And check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than a thousand previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labeled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Make a donation through paypal.me slash ianwolf or join my patrons at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolf. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.